the baseball trade deadline beckons. And here to give us heads or tails about what is going on in that world is one of the best in the business from Fox Sports and Sports Illustrated, Tom Verducci, back on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Tom? Great. Rich, how are you doing? I am better for talking to you. Tell me what you think is uh, going down with the biggest names available in baseball right now. Tom. Man, it is an upside down world. I mean, who would have thought when this season started, the Mets would be sellers, the Marlins would be buyers. <clears throat> but that's the world we have now. And that includes Justin Verlander. I think he's the biggest name in play. You know, once Scherzer was out the door, I actually back it up a couple of days, once David Robertson was out the door and Scherzer didn't want to be part of a team that wasn't trying to win the World Series, he was out. And now, really, I believe it's up to Justin Verlander if he wants to pitch for the Dodgers or the Astros. And I think the Mets would accommodate him if he goes to Steve Cohen and says, you know, I don't really like the writing on the wall here. You know, we're not close to being uh, competitors with the Atlanta Braves right now and maybe not next year. So if that's the case, you know, these guys are pushing 40, 41. It's all about the postseason, right? He wants to win, and he's obviously been in Houston. I think L.A. is attractive because they give you a shot to win every year. And we saw the Mets being able to throw so much money in these deals to buy down contracts that I originally thought the move of Verlander would be really risky for someone. I mean, he still has about $93 million left. That includes a, an option that can vest if he throws 140 innings next year, which I would expect Justin can do that. Um, but, yeah, with the money they threw in the Scherzer deal, think about this, Rich. The Mets paid a total of $107 million for Max Scherzer to win 20 games for them. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. So, hey, credit, they're using part of their resources. Their advantage, obviously, is their money, and they got a good prospect in return in that deal. But that tells me they can buy down Verlander's contract enough that if Justin says, you know, I'd rather go somewhere now and compete for a title this year, I think Steve Cohen would try to accommodate him. So uh, that has to be done by tomorrow, and these decisions have to be made right now those are the only two teams that verlander would want to go to or the only two teams that would actually be interested in him tom yeah i think it's all about what team he wants to go to i mean listen there's a ton of teams out there it's, it's interesting that the game is really devalued starting pitching we see that all the time right pitchers don't pitch to the lineup the third time around they don't win as many games we get all that but this time of year if you want to get to the postseason and go through the postseason everybody's looking for starting pitching has been driving the market here. And I still look at teams, especially with young pitching, like the Marlins, the Diamondbacks, the Reds, the Orioles. They all could use a starting pitcher right now just to get into the postseason, never mind get through a round or two. Uh, so, yeah, best one on the market would be Justin Verlander because I think the Padres at this point are going to hold on to Blake Snell. Um, but does Justin want to go to Baltimore, Cincinnati, Arizona? I don't know. I, I just think it's an easier – guess to say that yeah going back to houston is easy going to la is easy and tom verducci here on the rich eisen show tom i mean you want to talk about who, who would have guessed it um when trout went out before the all-star break um and rendon is still you know out and the uh the angels on sunday night baseball get beaten by an astros team that if i'm not mistaken scored six or seven runs in the ninth inning and then the yankees come into town and they put their foot down and not only start winning games, but the front office is, is making moves to support everything that's going there. And Otani is in a good spot right now, it seems like, a day before the trade deadline, right? Yeah. Tom? Isn't it amazing how, like, one week can change everything? Because yeah. you're right. After that game against Houston, it looked like the Angels were going to be sellers. And they went off and won six of their next seven. And now you've got a team with a winning record, four games out of the wild card, Trout coming back in the middle of August, there was no way Artie Moreno was going to trade the biggest asset in baseball, which is Shohei Otani. Because once you trade him, you lose the power of incumbency, the odds of trying to re-sign him, which are pretty low anyway, go to about zero if you move Otani. Uh, so it didn't make any sense to me that they would ever move him, but especially with a winning record, positive run differential, four games out of a wild card for a team that hasn't been in the postseason in eight years. Uh, yeah, they do the right thing. And listen, we've seen them be all it. I mean, like all it, underscore it, with the trades for Giolito, Lopez, and now uh, Taylor Ward gets hurt, and they right away pick up Gritchick and Crone. 
you got to love what the Angels are doing, man. We kill these teams a lot, Rich, for not trying too hard. You yeah. got teams that go into these rebuilding cycles. You can question Artie's methods and how effective they are, but at least his heart is in the right place. He's trying to win. And so the final few weeks of this season for the Angels, not only uh, for them to try and make a playoff run, uh, it, it, is it truly their best offer to Otani, right, is to show him that they can actually win with him? Or uh, if I'm not mistaken, did I just hear you say you thought the chances of them re-signing him were low to begin with, Tom. Yeah, I mean, this at least keeps them in play for Otani because, listen, if this team does have some kind of magical run, uh, you know, like the Rockies back in 07, you know, they get into the postseason riding a ton of momentum, you know, that's going to count a lot, I think, for Otani, who really does want to win. I think anybody who watched the WBC understood that. I mean, we saw Otani at his best when the games mattered the most. And don't get me wrong, th- those games mean a lot over in Japan, those WBC games. So that's what he wants to do. And if they turn a corner here, get into the postseason, that will mean a lot. I think, don't forget about this. I like a lot of great athletes. Shohei Otani is an incredible creature of routine. He loves, you know, being on his own program. He's on his own program because nobody else in baseball has done what he's done. The way he keeps himself healthy is just amazing doing both disciplines of pitching and hitting. He's just fanatical about his nutrition, about his sleep, about his training. You saw the other day he pitched in humidity and heat in Detroit and had to leave the game with cramps. I just think he loves Southern California. It's a little bit closer to home. Uh, Just the weather, the environment, the ability to be a two-way player, I think there's less wear and tear for him than some other places uh, where the weather is more of an issue. I think he's got everything he wants in Southern California, but I think the Dodgers have the most money to put on the table. They tried to sign him when he was in high school, Rich. I mean, that's that's their white whale they've wanted all these years. And even, you know, they've got the payroll flexibility now to go out and blow everybody else out of the water. Now, does it come down to the highest bid? If it does, it probably will be the Dodgers. If it's comfort level, maybe he is such a creature of routine that the Angels with, you know, now that, you know, the Angels have pushed their payroll above the luxury tax limit, maybe that's indication that things are going to turn a corner here and and he's all in. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows what Shohei wants other than I do believe He's tired of losing and not being in the postseason. He does want that. Well, I think the biggest question involve, involving him is how does he feel about the East Coast? How does he feel about the Amtrak corridor? You know, how does he feel about the the uh, the 24-7, 365, long-time listener, first-time caller fan base? You know, how, how comfortable could he be? Does he want that? That's the biggest question. It's a great, great, great question. Because if you remember when he was an international free agent, and the team lined up again. The first thing he did was pretty much rule out the Acela corridor, right? He didn't want to be part of that. And, you know, he, again, he creates his own schedule with the Angels. They don't tell him what to do, media obligations, you know, off the field obligations. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do that, I think, in the East, in Northeast, where they expect more of uh, just availability, if you will. Um, so I don't know. And again, the weather's a factor. Do you want to pitch and hit in cold weather in April and September? I don't know. I mean, maybe things have changed with Shohei, but it's instructive to me that at least when he first came over, he said, no, I, I'd rather not be. And, and that's knowing, obviously, the kind of money that seems like the Red Sox, Mets, and Yankees can spend. Very few free agents rule out the Northeast corridor when they hit the market. He did that. So maybe that is an indication few more minutes left with Tom Verducci here from Sports Illustrated, Fox, and so much more right here on the Rich Eisen Show. I was saying earlier, Tom, you know, look, as a diehard Yankee fan from way back in the day, I understand that the renaissance, the Joe Torre renaissance, Buck Showalter, then Joe Torre renaissance, and all those players were born out of George Steinbrenner being banned from baseball. I understand that he couldn't meddle the whole, you know, Ken Phelps, my baseball people stuff from Seinfeld back in the day. I get it. But I can't help but think uh, a performance like last night, nationally televised, pitcher who starts, doesn't get an out before giving up seven runs first, and then the lineup strikes out 18 times in being embarrassed by the Baltimore Orioles. George M. Steinbrenner III would have had somebody's ass in his briefcase by the end of the night. Um, w- what is Hal doing? Like, what is best on your reporting, his thinking about this season that is – gone so dreadfully for the Yankees. Uh, What can you tell me 
about this, Tom? Well, I think they've gotten caught here, you know, waiting for Aaron Judge and Carlos Rodon to get back. You know, I, they just knocked off too many days on the calendar. And, you know, they haven't stepped up for big-time players. They've tried to fill some holes here by by hitting on some off-the-radar guys. You know, the Billy McKinney's of the world, Jake Bowers of the world. I don't know if you win that division, that American League East, where the numbers got to be upper 90s, you would think, to win that division. Uh, and they got caught with the with a roster that's not built for today's game. You look at today's game, Rich, without the shift and the pitch timer, it's the younger teams that are leveraging the new rules. The athleticism plays, speed plays. The Yankees are an older team. They're actually, this is amazing, they're last in the major leagues in slugging against breaking pitches. There's more breaking pitches in the game now than ever before. So they've just got a roster that doesn't fit today's game, and they haven't been able to pivot in the course of this season. Uh, yes, you were right about the game last night to watch Severino get hit again a second time by Baltimore. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they took the swings like they knew exactly what was coming. Um, and there was hope there that he had turned a corner. Every time the Yankees take one small step forward, which was the case with Herman's perfect game, and look at the way he's pitched since then. He hasn't won a game since. They take two steps back. And, you know, this is hell week for them this week. They've got Tampa Bay and Houston seven straight. Uh, this will go a long way in determining – what the rest of their season looks like. But right now, they are not a good offensive team, and I don't think that is going to change appreciably in the next two months. Well, I mean, you know, shift, shouldn't a shift help somebody like Rizzo who can't get on base all of a sudden? I mean, shouldn't... It actually has helped. And I was just looking at that. He has the third highest increase in batting average on balls in play. Well, <laughs> where, about, just not the last two months? I mean, sir... I, I, not the last... But you're talking about ground balls to the right side. Where are the home runs? He's got one home run in the last two months. And, again, the Yankees – listen, Gene Michael, you know this, Rich, used to always say, you need left-handed power hitting to win at Yankee Stadium, right? right? They're, they're 27th and 28th in the major leagues in left-handed home run hitting and OPS. It, it's not there. And a big part of that is the way that Rizzo has fallen off the cliff. LeMahieu's hitting under 200 against fastballs. Stanton's hitting under 200 overall. These guys are all in their mid-30s now on the other side of their primes, and it hit them all in a hurry. So what happens? Are they look, Walk me through this week. Um, you know, the, are, are they sellers or buyers in any way, shape, or form over the next 24 hours? Because uh, you can't just wait and see how this week goes, you know, like it's time. Yeah, I, I'm – yeah, first of all, I think we're at the stage of the game now because this is a firewall to trade them on. You can't get sneak people through waivers the way you used to with right. the change in the rules a couple of years ago. So you look at every team, every team basically has a shot at the playoffs, is doing something this time of year because, you know, this is your last shot to address any deficiencies you have. The Yankees, I think, by 6 o'clock tomorrow have to come out of this with a legit hitter. I thought Cody Bellinger was the perfect fit for them. Uh, but he's not getting moved now. The Cubs just played like the Angels, played their way back into the race. Right. They're not going to move anybody. So I don't know where that bat is, um, mm. but they have to find something. They have to shoot high, and I, as I said, I don't think their offense as constituted is going to turn things around, even with Judge back. And it's amazing how good he looks in the first couple of games here, but he needs help. And uh, I think for the Yankees to sit idly by here and do nothing when their offense has been bad for the last couple of months, that would be a huge mistake. But in in the meantime, we're all paying rent in the Braves world right now. Tom, do you think? Do How you would think? you like to be Alex Anthopoulos? I mean, you talk about <laughs> very few problems. He goes out there and he needs a backup infielder. <laughs> That's his wish list, right? <laughs> Nicky Lopez. And he needs a right-handed curveball pitcher. So he gets Pierce Jones. <laughs> That's narrow his needs are. I mean, they throw the same lineup out there every day. They hit a gazillion home runs. They're leading every game after the first inning 4 nothing. it seems like. <laughs> and, oh, by the way, they're getting Max Fried and, and Kyle Wright back. So, yeah, right now it's it's the Braves and everybody else if you want to order them up a, uh, a World Series favorite. And in the American League, who's your World Series? Is it, I mean, can the Orioles do it? I mean, because they're playing, they're playing terrific baseball. They really are. You know, so what do you they think? They really are, and I've been so impressed with the job Brandon Hyde has done. They believe, not just think, but they believe that they can win a World Series. I question, though, I think they need another starting pitcher. 
you know, Tyler Wells has hit a wall a little bit here. Grayson Rodriguez thrown more innings than he ever has. Um, when you have a young staff, Rich, and a lot of these guys haven't pitched six months, and you're counting on that seventh month in October, high stress innings, to get you through three different rounds. I think they need another starting pitcher. And maybe it's not Verlander at the very top of the market, uh, but even if it's a Michael Lorenzen, Eduardo Rodriguez, I do think for that team to, World Se- to win a World Series, they need another starting pitcher. Well, I mean, do, do they have the – can they basically get the right to call up Verlander and basically ask him? You know, does does Kate <laughs> does does Kate like crab cakes? Do you want you know want Ravens tickets? <laughs> Seriously, you could spend two months with us, and that's and, well, you know, and they, then and then be mayor they, of this city from, the rest of your life. You know, like it's possible. From, you know, he's from Northern Virginia, so you can sell him on the coming back home angle there, right? right? Old Dominion. So, I mean, it's not crazy. I don't know that the Orioles would do that, but I will tell you this that they could satisfy the Mets easily. I mean, the, the Orioles, you see it right now. Their major league roster is just loaded with young talent that's yeah. not going anywhere. I'm telling and you, Tom, moved, Tom, that's what I'm driving nuts at. them, Rich. It's crazy. They're so loaded. I know. It's they just... have so many guys right now who are just, you know, the blocks from getting to the major leagues that they can easily trade top prospects and not hurt their position the next couple of years. All right. I know I've had you for a long time. I got one last one. Your favorite yeah. Ellie Dela Cruz story that you've heard. Is what? What do you got for me, Tom Verducci? <laughs> Your favorite story about this kid in Cincinnati that is, I think he ran first to th- uh, home to third in uh, Dodger Stadium in less than 11 seconds. So I think that happened yeah. over the weekend. So what do you got no, for me? He, he, throw, he throws the ball harder than anybody across the diamond. Think about this. He's a six foot five switch hitter who can play shortstop. That literally has never happened in the history of the game. And, and you see this. You know, in the NBA with Wemby and, and his wingspan and what he is at, what, 18, 19 years old, mm-hmm. you're seeing with some of the quarterbacks in the NFL, we're just seeing this age now where we're breaking the entire mold of what we think of as physically possible to play certain positions. And he's just a physical marvel, uh, speed and power combination like we've never seen, and switch hitting to be able to play shortstop. So, yeah, I just look at him, and I know we use that the term unicorn for Shohei, but in his own way, he's a unicorn. I can't find a comp like him that I've seen. I know people mentioned Eric Davis was an incredible young player, Mm -hmm. talent stealing 50 bags a year for the Reds, but no, I I haven't seen a a kid like this, and he is still a kid um, with this this kind of skill set at his size and speed. And just, and, but also the way he plays the game when he stole home in Milwaukee, after providing the team with the go-ahead run just to get on base, and then he provided the insurance run by stealing three consecutive bases and two pitches. Um, honestly, that's eye-popping. And it's interesting you mentioned Otani in the same sentence. I, I wouldn't, uh, I, you know, I know it's just only a few weeks here, but uh, he's had me. He had me at hello, that kid in Cincinnati. Hey, Tom. listen, Rich, that play you mentioned, stealing home there, that's my favorite play of the year. Because how many guys just put their head down to say, I just stole third base, right? Yeah, right. The fact that he had his head up looking for more, I saw years and years ago, I saw Paul Molitor score from third base when the pitcher dropped the return throw from the catcher. And that still stands out in my mind. When you, when you don't accept routine and you're always looking for more, I mean, Paul Molitor was probably in his 30s. This is a kid's first year in the big leagues doing something like that. That's my favorite play of the year. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, John Sadak, who's been calling, you know, these great moments and, you know, meeting the moments um, for the Reds in the booth. We had him on. He said J.R. House, the third base coach, was going to dap up Ellie after he stole third. And Ellie De La Cruz, you know, Paid, paid him no mind and he's wondering what's wrong with the kid and it's because he was thinking of stealing home right as soon as he got to third is what he said that that from that amazing play. that's a high baseball iq right there i love it thanks for the time tom let's do this more often i love our chats Be, hey man always a pleasure and you, i enjoy it thanks and you're and you're at rays yanks tonight is that where you're doing? Yeah, tonight? I got raised Yankees tonight on MLB Network with Matt Vescursion. So uh, be an interesting one. Oh. Judge back in the Bronx. Might need some earmuffs. You might need some <laughs> earmuffs by the by the end of the first. You never know. But uh, thanks for the time. Appreciate it. We'll be there. You got it, man. Catch the Rich Eisen show every single day on the Roku channel, twelve to three Eastern for free. 